My name is Samuel Lukotun. I am a solutions engineer at Circle CI. And joining me today is Brian Reed, Chief Mobility Officer at Now Secure. We're going to be talking about how Circle CI and Now Secure integrate, specifically around our OBS feature. And we're going to be discussing that within the context of how to help you and your teams deliver secure, high quality mobile apps faster with continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous testing. So before we get started, just a quick note, just a quick note keeping issue here. As we're going through, we're going to have time later at the end for a question and answer session. So as you're going through, if you have any questions, if there's any point you need us to clarify, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little Q&A icon in there. You can click on that and enter your question in the field that shows up, and then Brian and I will address that later on in the webinar. So our agenda for today is we're going to go through brief introductions. I'm going to talk briefly about Circle CI and our product. Then I'll be passing over control to Brian, who will talk a little bit more about Now Secure itself. And then together, we're going to talk about how Circle CI and Now Secure integrate to provide value and to ease development for you and your team. And as I mentioned earlier, then we'll save some time at the end for some Q&A where we can go through any questions you have or any points that you would like us to clarify. And so jumping right into it, uh, introductions. I'm Samuel Lukatun, as I said. I'm a solutions engineer at Circle CI. Before I moved into this role, I was working as a full stack software engineer. So my discussions and my interactions within this context tend to focus on how Circle CI helps developers because I tend to look at it from the perspective of my past life as a software engineer. And with that, I'll be passing it over to Brian. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Reed. I'm the Chief Mobility Officer at Now Secure. So I'm a long-standing journeyman in application development tools, middleware infrastructure, and cloud. I've actually been working on mobile since the BlackBerry days at the turn of the century. So that gives me about 20 years on mobile and mobile apps. I work a lot with our customers on strategy, on technology implementation, on building a DevSecOps pipeline specific, specifically around uh, mobile requirements and getting apps into production with, with Apple and Google and all the rest. So I'll be sharing a bunch of best practices today. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be working with you today. And jumping right into it, let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of Circle CI. So at Circle CI here, we like to say our mission is to make it as easy as possible to go from idea to delivery. In a nutshell, what we're trying to say is we want to empower engineers to go from, hey, I have this idea, I'm going to write some code and get it as quickly and as seamlessly as possible to the end point where you have your customers consuming the app you've just built. And a little bit about Circle CI as a company. We were founded in 2011. We now have a little bit over 300 employees spread across five continents. As I said earlier, we like to help teams build better software quicker and more reliably. And today we like to boast about us being the largest shared CI CD platform. We are built for cloud. We run over a million builds per day on our platform. And this is just a brief highlight of some of the logos and the icons, the brands that are currently using Circle CI. So at Now Secure, our mission is really to save the world from unsafe mobile apps. And what we'll share today is some interesting statistics on uh, the current rate of mobile application security uh, successes and failures. And what we really try to do is partner with organizations to ensure that the mobile apps they build are safe and secure. Now, as an organization, uh, we've been around for 10 years. Uh, we literally wrote the book on mobile forensics. We have some developer uh, secure software development guides we'll be sharing later. And so we span from mobile forensics, mobile pen testing, all the way through mobile automation software for development teams to deliver secure mobile apps. And as you can see from the icon array, we work with companies large and small, from Uber, who's a mobile first business, to Cisco, the largest technology company in the world, and many others. And we look forward to sharing some of those stories today. So if we think about mobile, right, you know, the, the Circle CI technology works on any kind of application, but today we're going to focus a bit on mobile because that's where, where Now Secure comes from. And it, some pretty amazing stats now that, that over 70% of all digital time spent in the world is actually spent on mobile, not on web. I mean, we all have a smartphone. I happen to have about a dozen uh, with tablets and everything else, but that's the business I'm in, right? And so customer business, your customers, your employees are living on mobile. And so we need to make sure we deliver a first-class mobile experience, but also deliver a secure mobile experience. And with the, the current economic slowdown and the COVID spike of everybody working at home, like Sam and I, um, you know, and all of you probably as well, right? We have this spike in the need for remote worker enablement. So we've been working a lot to try to help businesses who are spiking their work now around mobile. So as we move on to the next slide, 
the, the interesting thing about mobile, right, is, is I've been around mobile development teams, probably a thousand of them now in the last 20 years, and everybody wants to build really great apps. I mean, I remember building the first apps on the BlackBerry to prove you could do it. I remember when I got my first iPhone and it had all these icons and I was trying to figure out what to do with it. And we built our first uh, app in a new development language and then Java morphed into Android. And everybody wants to build a great app and they want their users to have a really great user experience. But one of the shocking things that, that I've learned over the years is that in the race to build a great mobile app, people don't always build the most secure app that respects you know, security and privacy standards. And in fact, more often than not, a mobile developer comes from web and they may or may not understand all the technical differences. And frankly, building a mobile app is a much rawer experience and where a browser includes a lot of security controls, a mobile development environment does not. And so we have these high rate of security bugs, you know, high rate of, of uh, privacy violations by looking at the 4 million apps in the App Store. And so what we want to do is find a way to build automated security testing into the pipelines, which will reduce the escape defect, right, and in a, in a help organizations improve. So if we move on. Right. And so what a key point that Brian made out there is that there's a great amount of time that consumers are using that they're spending on mobile devices. And so as we're building a lot of apps, a lot of those apps, if we're having security issues in there, we're exposing a large number of our customer base to these issues and to these bugs. And so the role that CICD essentially plays in your software delivery lifecycle is that we help with the automation of the building, the testing, and the delivery of your applications to facilitate the seamless progression Across all the across all the phases of the life cycle. So if we're looking at this graphic that we're showing here, we're talking about from your coding to your building to your testing, and then your release, your deploy, your run, your monitor. Through all those phases, you do not want to be manually integrated or manually going through to move your code through that, because then it becomes it makes the quality and the, the it makes the quality and the security of your app become an extra burden for you and your development team. If you can automate this and make it seamless and make it a progression that just goes automatically when new changes hit your platform, that's something that helps eliminate or minimize or at least mitigate those risks that you're exposing your customers to and your companies as you're building these apps. And so like, if you, just to reiterate on some of those capabilities and the features and the benefits of implementing CI/CD, is that with CI/CD in place, you're able to go through faster release cycles. You're able to lower the risk of those releases because you're running tests automatically. You're guaranteeing that things that are hitting production meet a certain threshold of quality. And as, like I said, higher quality. And with higher quality comes lower cost because you spend less time reworking things that you've already pushed into production. You spend less, less time going back, fixing bugs. So if you have CI/CD in place, what is life going to look like for your team? It means that things are going to fail fast. When someone makes a mistake, you're going to know right away because automatically we're going to run a test and we're going to give you feedback that, hey, this failed the test or this failed the build. Also, it gives you the, your team an opportunity or the affordance to be able to quickly fix issues. Because if you know right away when things fail and right away you know that there's a bug in the system, now you have the, you're now notified and you can quickly go in and then fix it before more code hits your production branch. In addition to that, being able to quickly identify issues and know when things fail, give you the opportunity to quickly resubmit those fixes and to make sure that your production branch of your code stays stable. So with CICD in place, one of the biggest benefits in that that gives your team is that there's a process around which your development, your deployment, your delivery, your testing, all of that happens. And the thing, the benefit with engineering and processes is that you can always go into any place within that process and tune it and optimize it and fine tune it for the output or the metrics that you're trying to gain or to the targets you're trying to hit as a team. So what I'm showing here is just a spread of several metrics that different companies, different customers on CI CD that are currently using Cepa CI have been able to optimize their pipelines and their devil's practices in order to use, in order to hit. So we've seen things like test time reduction at trials back. We've seen cost savings, if that's something that your team is tracking. And we've also seen things like developer throughput. So having a process in place around your development practices really gives you an opportunity. It gives you something tangible to go optimize and to fix when you have targets that you're trying to hit. And here again, just some more metrics and some, just more metrics and stats that we track on our platform that using CI/CD actually like shortens the lead time for changes. It increases the, the, how frequently your teams can deploy within a sprint cycle. It reduces how long it takes to recover from, let's say when there's an error in the system, it reduces how long it takes to recover and to restore to a green build. And furthermore, it reduces the percentage of new changes and new features hitting your, your production branches that fail. 
And so with that, I'll be passing over to Brian, who's going to talk about the CT portion of today, which of our discussion today, which stands for the continuous testing. Absolutely. You know, I, I wish that a CI pipeline had existed 15 years ago when I was writing my blaps, right? You know, we were in the agile world and, you know, we, did, we had manual testing and some test scripting and, you know, it was a real adventure. And so, you know, when, when CI CD got created, right, we, we got this net acceleration of throughput and letting the systems do the work, the fast fail, the incrementalism and everything else. And to a degree, testing got left, you know, behind the wayside. And so we moved and sometimes developers are writing their own unit tests. Maybe you're using a third party test automation tool and to a large extent, QA engineers have become test automation engineers. And as we move through the testing cycles, right, you have functional test, UX testing, you have user acceptance testing, but you also have security testing. And to a large extent, that notion of automated testing has been behind. And so we've been working a lot in the marketplace now over the last 10 years. Uh, more specifically over the last five or six, or I'm really automating the testing cycle to go with all the power of CI and CD, you really need the continuous testing because it's not just about the code that you write, it's making sure that code can go safely into production from a user quality perspective, whether that quality means the screen is formatted correctly or the button works when you push it to making sure there's no security vulnerabilities in that code that you're deploying. And so CT is really the next piece, which is why we talk CI, CD, CT. And so now you can security test every single build every day. There is technology that will enable you to do that. And that allows you to do the earlier testing, which elim eliminates the, the late stage delays. And of course, you know, what that means from an outcome perspective is better throughput. Uh, I was just on a call with a customer earlier today where they were talking about dramatic performance improvements because they're incrementally testing new code written every day as opposed to waiting to test sort of big bang. You write a thousand lines of code a day. If it takes a hundred days, that's a hundred thousand lines of code for your security team to test at the end. You know, you don't want to do that. I think we've learned that unit tests and functional tests are critical as part of an accelerated DevOps pipeline. We need to make sure that security tests are also incremental and run through that. And that way you can deliver high quality code on the end. And so as we go forward, right, there's some really great metrics here, right? So dramatic in, in, uh, increase in, in release cycle speed and cycle time because of the elimination of late stage security testing that finds vulnerabilities. And sometimes organizations just have to sign off and let it go. Um, dramatic reduction in bug escape defect, right, right, common just add security to your existing bug escape defect rate and look for improvements there. And of course, elimination of false positives in the way you do it. One of the things that's unique about the technology we built, it has automated POC generation in the technology, which means that we don't have false positives. And so that eliminates some of the wasted time with some traditional security tools that generate a high false positive rate. So as we move on, when we think about really working together now, so it's all about in a CI, CD, CT world, it's all about dev, QA, and SEC, right? Plus the ops team, of course. I'm just going to kind of lump ops team into all of it. All of them working together in a seamless way. But it's also about them not doing all the work. It's about the systems and the technology like Circle CI and Now Secure that automate all the grunt work wrapped around that so they can focus on making sure their primary jobs, their primary tasks are accomplished. And so when we think about the software delivery life cycle, right, everybody's got their picture of how this works. Here's kind of a, a circular diagram, right? Starts with requirements design, coders, developers write their code, they commit it, you build, you test, you stage, you deploy, right? And you iterate as necessary through that cycle. Hopefully you've got good quality requirements and a good backlog. Therefore you get efficiency on the left-hand side of this. And then you want to make sure that the cycle itself runs reliably and quickly and so on and so forth. So that means building testing into the pipeline. That means optimizing the workload of all those different stakeholders throughout that cycle in order to achieve the efficiency and the innovation that you need on the tail end. All right. And so if we take that image that Brian has just talked about and that flow that he's just described, and then we ask ourselves, what role does CICD actually play in there? And you can see that CICD allows you to enforce best practices across your teams and across your projects. It also allows you to automate standard operating procedures. So you know now for a fact that one team of, in, let's say, the iOS department isn't doing something different from your Android department. You can have your CICD and you can have like templatized systems and share that across your projects and across your teams. And furthermore, it provides having CICD systems in place allow you to get easy access to what we consider to be hardware, for instance. If you're doing iOS builds, 
the, a lot of the other alternatives that you have is to maintain your own fleet of iOS devices or Mac devices. If you're using Circle CI, for instance, we take care of all of those concerns for you. So you can easily provision and spin up those resources without needing to actually have your own fleet on, on hand on-prem. And so when we talk about where Circle CI sits in that tool chain and that whole life cycle, essentially, we are at the core, in the middle, what we call the orchestration layer. So if we think of your VCS and your code repositories as your creation, where you actually write your code, and we think about your endpoints, your customers, your, your application stores as your logistics, or like where you actually deploy your code, Circle CI is what sits in the middle where we orchestrate all those tests, your security tests, unit tests, penetration testing, all the other concerns that you need to do between you've written your code and your customer is using it. Circle CI sits in between all of those and as, as the orchestration layer. And so as we think about now secure in the cycle, then we bring the, the security layer in, right? So uh, from a now secure perspective, we focus on automated security testing of every build in your CI pipeline that's run by the Circle CI platform. So we will automatically test every build every day and we'll show you what that looks like today. We will also monitor those applications as they go into production. So we can monitor them through the CI. We can also monitor them through the app stores, Google Play and uh, uh, Apple App Store, along with an MDM, for example, if it's, a, if it's an internally deployed app. Now, as part of that life cycle, right, we're just not the only security testing tool. And so most of our customers, successful customers, will have security training that will be going on. They'll be doing uh, code repo, SCA scans, especially for open source because of how much open source is fed in. And you may have a static source security code IDE plugin. There's guys like Synopsys that have these great spell checker oriented code correction security code correction uh, tools that can really drive developer productivity. So then you, you have well-educated developers coding securely, leveraging you know, spell checker tools to code correctly. They check their code and it's got a higher propensity to be secure in the first place. You build through Circle CI, then you automatically test the results and then you automatically feed the tickets back to the developers using your ticketing system so they can go fix it. And as Sam said, all the device hardware infrastructure you need is spun up and available. So you don't have to have those fleet of devices to do your builds or to do your testing because they're included as part of the process. Back to you, Sam. Oh, I'm sorry, back to me. So um, in terms of flow, it's really straightforward. We're an on-demand SaaS platform that can also be installed on, installed on premise. So an API driven front end means that we can feed through a Circle CI orb, which we'll show you today. Uh, we also plug into lots of other tools, the app stores, as I said. You can log into a web interface, upload a binary on demand. You can plug the API into the IDE your developers are using and a myriad of systems. We ingest the binary. We run multiple, four multiple passes on the binary. So we do static, dynamic, and interactive analysis on that. And then we provide well-formatted and summarized results out the back end that really focuses on what are the P1s, the P2s, and the P3s that your developers need to fix. That can be fed into a JIRA or other type of ticketing system. You can also feed that into other places or just simply see them by logging into our portal as well. So it's an easy as one, two, three type of cycle. Typical test pattern, depending on the complexity of your app, is 15 to 30 minutes. We can break the build and we can route the results wherever you need to go. Right. And so when we think about how this works, and I'll show you a little bit of this in a minute. Um, so, you know, Circle CI runs the build, completes the build, the Circle CI orb launches now secure in the background, passes us the binary from the build, we go spin up the device farm, we run the tests for you, and then we feed the test results back into Circle CI and into a ticketing system like here's a JIRA screenshot, for example. So then you can be looking through the results there. And, and that's great because JIRA may, or whatever ticketing system you use, will have the routing rules for which developers need to fix which bugs of which kinds and all the rest. And so for most development teams, they never actually log into the now secure platform. They're just using the IDE, the CI and the ticketing system they know, and that's just where they live. Awesome. All right, thanks, Brian. And I think now let's just take some time to show everyone what the platform looks like. And so we're just gonna do a real quick demo here. And let me switch over. So Brian, can I get a thumbs up if you're seeing a Circle CI workflow now? Awesome, perfect. 
Okay, so what I'm showing here is a sample workflow on Circle CI for a project I'm building. And if you're coming from a background of any other CI CD tool, let's say Jenkins, for instance, you've probably seen something like this. This is just a graph that shows the dependency of all the jobs that are running as part of this build. So when I say the build, I'm talking of everything it takes, everything that happens once I commit until this hits production, for instance, if this is a deploy job. And so while each one of the jobs here themselves are they're running in an independent execution environment. So I can, what that allows me to do on Circle CI is I can configure each one of these to have different resource classes. What that means is let's say my deploy staging job here, if this was taking 10 minutes to run and I want to get this whole pipeline down to let's say five minutes, I can throw a little bit more CPU at this particular job because it's running in an independent environment, it's running in an independent container. And Circle CI gives us the feature, the ability to assign different CPU or different, we we'll call them resource classes on the platform to different jobs as they run on the platform. Furthermore, the fact that these are all running in independent environments means they can also have their own independent tool stack, their own tool chain, their own OS running in the job. For instance, if you want to do something like matrix testing, if you want to test an API across various versions of your app, for instance, you can just spin up each one of these containers with a different copy of the different version of those APIs and then hit it directly in parallel. Furthermore, we support building on Linux, on Windows, on Mac OS, as well as using Docker containers. And so just a high level just to show you what it's available and what we support on Circle CI. As far as setting all of this up, however, everything happens in a YAML file. So configuration on Circle CI happens in a config.yaml file that you check into the root of your source of your project on your source control. And I just wanted to point out a few sections of what that config file looks like. I want to talk specifically about the workflow section, the job section, and this ops feature that we're talking about that integrates Circle CI with the third-party vendors. In the workflow section, this is where you get to orchestrate how those jobs run in relation to each other. So if you look at lines 93 and 94, for instance, here I have a test and build job that are going to run in parallel because I haven't set any dependencies or any requirements on them. If we look at a deploy staging job, however, here I'm specifying that I want it to depend on the test and build jobs. So what that means for my pipeline is that unless the test and build jobs both succeed, deploy staging isn't going to run. So just a high level of what workflows allow you to do within Circle CI in terms of orchestrating and setting the order in which your jobs get to run. Next, moving on to the jobs. So this is the section where you actually get to define what happens as part of each step or part of each concern on in your build pipeline. So for my build step, for instance, what I want to do is I want to check out my code. I want to set up the remote Docker. So this is a feature that on Circle CI allows you to connect remotely to a Docker environment. And with the Docker layer caching on here, without having to write any additional code, without having to do any additional backend setup, we allow you to cache Docker layers on that remote Docker, on that remote Docker executor in such a way that if you run your build again in the future, and there are some of those layers that haven't changed, instead of rebuilding them on Circle CI, we just pull them from the cache, and that saves you some time in optimizing your build. And so the rest of this job is just the commands I'm using. In here, I'm logging into Docker, I'm building my Docker image, and then I'm pushing that image to Docker Hub. So and so that's essentially what happens in, within a job. And then the op feature itself here is the special magic sauce that we're talking about today. And so the op feature is what allows you to templatize chunks of your config and then share that across teams and across projects. So let's take a look at this build job, for instance, that I'm running. Let's say that every project, if I have three different projects and they all run this similar logic for the build, what I'm doing is I'm logging into Docker, I'm building a Docker image, and then I'm pushing that image up to Docker Hub. I don't want to rewrite and copy and paste this across all of my projects and across all the other teams. What I can do is instead is I can templatize this section of my config and I can have things that are particular to my project. Like for instance here, my namespace, I can have that passed in as a parameter and then I can check that in as an orb into Circle CI's orb registry and then have other members of my team pull that down and use it when they're writing their code, when they're writing their config. Here we have a sample one from Node, this is our Node orb. And so here what I'm doing up here is I've, specific, I've imported the, the orb, I'm adding it in, I'm bringing it into my namespace as the Node namespace here. And when I'm using it, I'm using this command in that orb called the Node with cache. And what this allows me to do is that with this one line, I am invoking a command that's written in that template, that configuration file, that's about two to 300 lines long. And so here, I don't have to copy and paste chunks of that config file into my own configuration file to use it. I can just right, pick up the line that I need, reference that within my configuration file, passing whatever, whatever parameters I need, and then just use that in there. So that's the config file, that's the op feature. And now going back to our deck. Uh, okay, one more thing I wanna show before I pass it back 
to Brian is what things look like. So this is how the platform looks like when things are failing, when my job succeeds, runs successfully. When it fails, however, on other platforms, specifically talking about Jenkins now, a lot of engineers have issues that they have to go and dig through logs to identify what has gone wrong. On Circle CI, one of the features we offer for you is just this quick, easy, clear visual representation of where things go wrong. Furthermore, knowing that this deploy staging job has failed, you can actually click into this job and get more details about all the steps that ran in that job. So if you remember all those commands I showed in my configuration file that were running as part of that one individual job, on Circle CI, for each one of those commands, will give you an output to the screen that shows you what the result of that command was. So if one of your jobs fail, you will get an output that tells you which one of those commands in that job was responsible for triggering the failure, as well as an error message that shows you what went wrong. Furthermore, on Circle CI, we have this feature that allows you to rerun the job with SSH. And what that looks like is when you click the rerun job with SSH, it spins up that same job that just failed with the exact same parameters. The only thing different now is that it opens an SSH port on the remote container that allows you to remotely connect from your terminal into the container that's running your build job. And what that allows you to do now is to do live debugging while that job is running on that container. And so those are the key features I wanted to talk about just to show you what Circle CI looks like and how we help engineering teams recover from a failed pipeline. And with that, I'm going to be passing it over to Brian, who's going to show us a little bit of what the Now Secure platform looks like. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to get my demo environment up and running here and give me a chance to make sure I got all the right screens in the front. And so I'm going to share. You should see this in a second. Okay, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the now secure circle CI or rock and roll. All right, so um, as Sam said, we're part of the orb community. So we have an orb in the partner group here. Um, there's a full guide and commands, everything in here. It's very straightforward to set up. You do have to be a licensed now secure customer in order to use the orb because the engine has to be turned on. Uh, it's a very straightforward 15 minute configuration. We give you the config files that are necessary uh, in order to set up your runtime environment. And so from there, then it's a very straightforward walkthrough. Um, and so here's an example. I realize that um, screenshots are probably better than doing a full blown live demo of making sure my entire prod, uh, test the prod environment works. And so effectively what happens is the build gets loaded. Uh, as the build process completes, it then kicks off the now secure test. You can see test is off and running. You're getting the command script execution that's occurring in the back end. And the application is actually being loaded device passes occur on the device, the result set is then fed back into Circle CI, and Circle CI can take that diagnostic information, determine what to do. They might, for various reasons, uh, you might be configured to break a build or continue on or alert others, what have you. Um, and then you can also feed the data into a ticketing system. So here's an example uh, of a ticket being fed back to the developer. We found the app still has bug flag checked, even though the app is slated production needs. And so there's a zillion things that we will find in terms of security, vulnerability, privacy issues, and so on and so forth. We also find things like app store blockers. Now, to give you kind of a sense of the level of testing, because I know we have some security people on the call and some developers who might be interested in, in what we can find and catch, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to, uh, whoops, screens within my own product, if I can. Sorry, the toolbar is in the wrong place, so I can't actually, there we go. Um, and so, for example, here is my uh, production running environment. So in here, I have a series of applications. Um, these applications are being continuously tested over time. And we use a scoring algorithm to determine the safety or non-safety of the apps. And I'll explain that in a second. But you can see in the middle these curves where you can see that the Android score is gradually going up. That's good. That means I'm basically removing the bugs over time. You can see the iOS first app was actually really great. And then some someone introduced the bug and it cratered, and we've been clawing our way back up. Now we score on a range of zero to 100 from a, a security and privacy perspective. So these are all failing apps. Now, of course, my demo environment's full of apps that will show you interesting things. So uh, we don't wanna worry about that. So I'm gonna take a look at uh, one of our bad apps here. And so the Riva app here is an example of an application uh, that's really a commonly used test app for security professionals. Um, and so what you'll see here in the now security environment is we ran this heavy duty set of security tests 
We scored the app on a range of zero to 100, 90 to 100 is an A, 80 90 is a B. You remember when you went to school, so a 44 is a fail. And what we actually found is because we're loading the app on real devices and actually running the app through an automation scenario, we're able to see what actually happens in real time. And a big focus on our test is really around sense of data. Did you encode storage and network communications instructions correctly? Did you actually store and transmit the data securely? And what you can see here is that sensitive data, first name and last name were actually found in transport. That's a bad thing, especially if somebody can intercept that. We can also see that in many places, HTTP requests were detected. Now, a static source code tool might may or may not find all your instances of using HTTP. This is actually a live dynamic call with made, and we discovered calls going back and forth between the mobile app and the endpoint that were in clear text HTTP, and plenty of, of scary things could happen. Within those, we specifically found the first name, last name, and zip files all unencrypted going over the wire, which is a bad thing. We find lots of historical vulnerabilities like the AF networking and so on and so forth. We also find things like improper use of security controls, uh, the allowing of third-party keyboards that could be a vulnerability that could be exploited uh, with keyboard robots. We find sensitive data leaking over the air. We find sensitive data leaking over the on the device and you know all kinds of other places. Now, along with that, we provide lots of informational data as well. So what network backends, for example, did the application actually connect to, right? And, and what we found in the, in the fact that we dynamically test the app on a real rig is sometimes we discover it connects to a back end in a bad place. Uh, this particular, uh, the ping server in China. Uh, it may not be as relevant code like that, but maybe they picked out a piece of open source that you had unverified, had not properly verified. And while we were doing a trace route of that run, we discovered that it was transmitting data to a bad location, a bad API or what have you. So lots of, lots of inf interesting information comes back from that. I just got a message. My internet's having a little bit of trouble. So I did want to show you one other interesting app because what matters is tracking this over time. And so here's an example of an application where we can see that as the release cycles go, you can see it's actually yo-yoing between a really bad 25 and an only really bad 45 as they go through the cycle. And what's happened is because they're not properly continuously, every other, every build or every other build actually moves the score because new vulnerabilities are being injected or the old vulnerabilities are regression back after they get fixed. And so this is an example of an app going through that continuous testing process and following a yo-yo cycle. And if you're not continuously testing, using that testing of every lease every day, you're, or every build every day before you release it, you're not going to know. Sadly, this app makes it into production frequently in the app stores with cratered security scores because of that movement back and forth. And so because you now have visibility to the over time, now you can work with your development team to figure out what's going on with skills and process that's causing this yo-yo effect of vulnerabilities regressing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. One of these vulnerabilities was also because of a third-party library that they had switched to. So they switched their ad library to put some advertising in for revenue generation. And it turns out that ad library had a vulnerability in the ad library itself, which in turn made the application bad in and of itself. So with that, I'm gonna, gonna stop here and hand it back to you, Sam, to jump us back to the slides. Awesome, thank you, Brian. And one thing I wanna do real quick here is I just realized I, while I was showing the, while I was showing the config, well, while I was talking about the config file, I was actually not showing my, my IDE, <laughs> so, I couldn't, so no one could see what was going on. So just wanna quickly run over what I spoke about while no one could see what I was doing. I was talking about three sections of the config file and everything happens in YAML. And one of the key points I wanna point out is the benefit of having this in YAML is you don't need to go learn a new programming language or a domain specific language to start using separate CI. And so the workflows section is where you get to orchestrate how those jobs run and what order they run in. So here I was talking about test and build running in parallel because I hadn't set any dependencies or requirements for them. However, the deploy staging is going to wait for test and build to finish because I set this requirement that it waits, it depends on the test and build jobs. And then one other key fancy feature I'm using here is this approval type job here, which means promotes to production is going to wait until someone actually manually goes in and clicks it before it 
lets the deploy production run. So let me show you what that actually looks like in real life on the, the project we were looking at earlier. So here, that promotes the production that approval type job that's happening here. So this workflow that I'm building in here, you can think of it as I'm running build and test. I've just developed a new feature. I push it upstream. I run my build, I run my test. It's okay for me to deploy it to staging and then go do QA testing. But let's say my, the engineering manager doesn't feel comfortable with me deploying apps to production. So there's a separate QA or there's a separate ops team that goes in, does the QA check on staging environment. And when they're happy, when they're satisfied with it and the PM signs up on the release, then they come in here, they click the promotes to production. And then and only then does the deploy production step happen. So just a little feature in there that kind of helps with the operational controls within the teams. And so going back to our config file, I just talked about the approval workflow. One thing, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the job section. So this is where you get to define all of those individual jobs that are running. And each job would have a series of commands that can run within it. So if we take the build job, for instance, within the build job, I can do, I have my commands to check out my code, to set up my remote Docker environment. And then I run my commands for logging into Docker hubs, building my Docker image, and then pushing that image to Docker hub. And when I had talked about using the orbs feature, so this is where I import the orb. I specify the namespace I want to use within this config file. And then in my test job, I am using it here, where I have the node, that's the namespace slash the command. So this with cache command is not defined in this config file. It's actually defined in this orb that's written and checked into the orb registry. So that's the feature I was talking about in terms of allowing your team to be able to share code across multiple projects and multiple teams without copying and paste. Because now this with cache command is centrally maintained in that orb in the orb registry and all the teams that are using or that like or need that command can access it without having to copy and paste the implementation within their own configuration files. So that's what I wanted to show when I was talking about the config. If there are any questions on things I touch in, touch in here or things that need clarification, please drop that in the Q&A and we'll address that at the end. And so going back to the slides here. So yeah, here we just wanted to talk about, just give you a brief highlight of what our recommendations are for best practices in terms, as far as the CI, CD, CG conversation goes. And I guess, Brian, if you don't mind, I can just read through this or yeah? Yeah, no, it's all, it's all good, <laughs> all yours. Perfect, all right, so with the best practices are you want to automate everything you can in development chain. So that's where the benefit of having these systems in place are in the first place is that you take away the human element of having to manually go in and make all these changes. You take away the effort of human going in and making the changes or making the approval. Furthermore, like Brian happened on this earlier, you want to practice incrementalism, not just in your unit test and your functional test, but also in your security testing. Write small chunks of code, Test it, make sure it succeeds, and then you merge and you move on. Furthermore, you want to practice secure by design. There's some paradigms of security where, for instance, you think about security by obscurity, for instance, where you hide details and you hope that your, the attackers don't find it. Not a safe way to implement security in your tools. You want to design your apps from the ground up to be secure. That means ensuring that you have security requirements in place, that you train the team that are developing these apps to be well-versed in the team security requirements. Security, everyone, is not just a concern of the security team. So that's what we're trying to hash on, harp on here is that security is a cultural thing that permeates every level of the development team within the company. Furthermore, we want you to run automated functional and security tests to validate builds. Yeah, we're, again, we're talking about that automation. You don't want to be manually going in or you don't want to push your code and then have to go into your terminal and finally go around like, your, okay, let's push test and then have that be the process for kicking off CI, CD or CT. Also, we want you to ensure that only tested code is integrated into the production code base. Sounds straightforward, sounds like common sense, but a lot of times we see teams where they run into hotfix scenarios or they have issues they only need to push. It's end of the sprint, we want to hit our releases real quick. And people are just starting to roll in code into production that looks good enough, even though it hasn't written, run through all the tests. Don't fall into that trap. And finally, we want you to monitor the metrics and processes to drive continuous improvement. Now, this goes back to the very first point we made in the beginning about the, having that process in place gives you something to actually optimize and to work on. If you don't have CI, CD, and CT procedures in place, when you need to get better, there's nothing tangible for you to actually go get your hands on and to start tweaking to improve. So these are just a few best practices and recommendations from Brian, who is a veteran in the field, and me, who is still learning and trying to show everyone what I've learned so far. And so with that said, we want to show you a few more resources. 
There's a, a lot of docs, a lot of blogs, places to go for support related specifically to Circle CI. You'll be getting this presentation after the webinar, so don't worry and try to write all of this down right away. And on the next slide, we have resources that will help you learn more about now secure and implementing their platform within, within your projects. And so with all of that said, we're now going to be turning over to our Q&A. And we're going to be looking through the chat here to see what questions have popped up. If you have any other questions that you haven't asked in the chat, now is a good time to just drop it in there. And we're going to be going through the list right now. OK, and this one is for you. Brian, we have an attendee asking, is the now secure platform prepared to handle the hybrid mobile applications? So we're talking about applications that are built with tools like React Native and Flutter. Yeah, so as long as it's compiled into a binary and can actually run on a device, we can test it, right? So we don't test web apps, we don't test uh, web browser uh, environments, but we will test an app as long as it's compiled down. Right, so uh, we are testing apps that are apps that are built with Flutter, for example. There's lots of different development frameworks. We can also test low code, no code tools, uh, and so on and so forth. So we continue to be able to evolve our testing. You know, the operating systems have evolved, development languages uh, continue to change, right? So we went from Objective-C to Swift, for example, on, on iOS. And so uh, as long as it's compilable, compiled down into a binary in some way, shape, or, or um, form, then we can test it. Oh, awesome. Great. And you touched a little bit about on this in your conversation earlier when you talked about you're comparing now secure and talking about what extra it does compared to a static analysis tool. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're different from a static analysis tool? Sure. So if you, if you think about, um, for those of you who are more security inclined, a static analysis tool typically takes your source code and analyzes your source code. It might be analyzing your source code in the IDE as you write it, like the spell checker I mentioned. It could also be scanning your code repo after check-in or at check-in point, and it's gonna be looking within the source code for patterns. And so if you think about things in life, right, there's words you use or strings you use that, depending on the context, may or may not be good. And that's what winds up happening with static source code tools. So in general, while they find things, they're very verbose, they have a high false positive rate. You know, the average static source code vendor brags that they only have a 38% false positive rate. And so what you're gonna wind up doing is you got a lot of false positives, but the other thing is you're only testing whatever code runs through that test channel of the code repo or the IDE. Our approach is to actually test a compiled binary. Now, now why is that different and better? Well, first off, the compiled binary contains all the code in the app. That means the code you wrote, the open source library, the frameworks, or anything else that you bring along for the ride. And then we test that compiled binary on a real device to make it a real, real world experience. And so while static source code testing is looking, did you write the code the right way? What we're really testing for is, can a hacker attack and crack your app and export data out of it? Does your app unconsciously or uh, randomly leak data, right? And the source code guys just aren't designed to do that. And that's why we have some people who run both, right? They like the experience of developer having the IDE assistance, but because we do static dynamic and interactive analysis of that app at runtime, you get a much fuller view. You know, it's sort of like, do you want the doctor poking at your knee saying, yeah, I think it's broken or do you want the MRI, right? I mean, that's sort of kind of the difference of what winds up happening find best in class just to kind of complete the thought best in class companies have four things they do one is they train their developers they have some sort of training program in place two is they have some sort of open source uh analysis tool like a synopsis or a um, black duck or or uh sonotype or something like that three is they have an ide plugin that's like the spell checker lots of the vendors i just mentioned have that sort of making sure as you write the code you're reducing the chance you're going to miss miss test something or miscode something. And then four, they have the security testing automation that, that we looked at that now Secure does today. And it kind of does take a village to make sure at every single point, the right things are done with security. And that way you get a high quality application out the other end. I see. Okay. So continuing on that point, is it would now Secure replace a static analysis tool? Since you it sounds to me like now Secure is more than static analysis. More than, yeah. So if you have now yeah. Secure in place, would you still need a static analysis tool? Yeah, it's funny. I saw that question, so I was kind of leaning forward on my answer. The, the reality is your mileage will vary, right? Okay. You don't technically need one. However, 
because we're going to give you as complete coverage or more than that static tool. However, you know, the notion as we sit here, you know, if you're using Microsoft Word or, or Google Docs, I'll just use that as an example, it's basically spell checking as you go. And I find a lot of developers really like that, that static spell checker model that helps them write better code before they check it in, right? Just like I like the having Google or Microsoft helping correct, auto-correct my spelling as I go. There's, there's definitely value uh, in developer productivity, performance, and learning by, by having that. So if you've got the budget, having both is probably best because then developers get what they want and gets what they want and you have the, the highest quality coming out the other end. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And this next question looks like this one's for me. So the question is more along the lines of what are recommendations for how to isolate pipeline experimenting? So let's say you're on a team and you want to go test out the Circle CI and now secure integration, but you don't want that to go wrong on your production build, right? We're just running experiments here. How do I handle that? So that's a great question. And the way you, ha you handle that on Circle CI is you want to use our filter feature on Circle CI. So when I showed that workflow config, they were searching for each one of those jobs that are going to run in your workflow. You can pass in a filter parameter that specifies what branch that's going to run on, or it also specifies what tags, what Git tags are going to trigger that workflow. So what that allows you to do is you can have, actually let me share my screen. It'll be a little bit easier to talk through this. Uh, let's just share the whole desktop and point back into my IDE. So if I go back down into my workflow section here, like part of the parameters I'm passing into this workflow, this job here, deploy production, for instance, is I'm passing in context, I'm passing it requires. Another one we could pass in here, for instance, is we have one that's called the filter keyword. And so with this, I can then specify branches. And if I only wanted this to run on my personal feature branch, for instance, I can have something like a feature star. And this key in here supports regex. So if you have whatever pattern you use for your own personal branches, you can have that in here. And the only time this workflow, this particular workflow or that particular job within that workflow will kick off is when the conditions, the commit that comes in is either coming from this branch that, that begins with this expression, or I could also replace this branch with a git tag. I could have tags in here instead of branches. And so then the only time it will kick off would be if I push a git tag that matches the expression that I have in here. And so that's how you would address the experimentation concern. And next, another question here is, does Circle CI offer free trials for the platform? Yes, so we have free trials for open source projects. Uh, if you have, and part of that free trial includes, it gives you limited build minutes, but it does allow you to build on Circle CI without having a paid account. Furthermore, though, however, if you want to use a full trial of Circle CI, we do offer two-week two week free full production trials to corporate teams if you sign up via our sales team. So for that, if you need more information, you can contact me and I'll forward your information to the team that handles that. And one more for you, Brian, is do you have, does Now Secure have a free trial version? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, yes, we have a variety of different uh, licensing options, right? So our unit of measure is apps. So you get limited thing in your pipeline on a per app or per binary basis. So figure out how many pipelines you want to fire up and you're off and running mathematically. You can fine tune your testing too. Do you want quick testing? Do you want deep testing and so on and so forth? And so you can turn the dials whatever way you want it to work. What's great is that the automation will take care of 200 plus tests. And if you were to go do a pen test and have a human expert do it, it'd take you two weeks. We do 80% of what a human expert does in 15 minutes, uh, which is just sort of astounding. And one of the reasons I joined the company so many years ago. So yes, we do. Uh, you can get to the NASCAR website, ask for a demo, and we'll get you started on a trial. Wonderful. And then what's the production billing model like for now secure? Yeah, so the billing model is on a per app basis. So depending on how many apps you have, we do unlimited testing of that app during the year. It's an annual subscription. Uh, so you just pick how many apps you have and then you can do unlimited testing and you plug it into your pipeline and you get it up and running and it's, it's really great. And what's also nice about the environment is we do have a uh, role-based access control, single sign on a lot of the enterprise capabilities you want. So you might have a very large team and you have different pipelines and you want to restrict usage to different pipelines. Or as one of your other question people said, you may want to experiment with one or two pipelines, but not turn it on everywhere, then turn it on more later 
and so on and so forth. So we get lots of flexibility in and how you can deploy and configure, you know, based on your environment requirements. Got it. And in parallel on the Circle CI side, in terms of billing, we build on a per seat model, and then you get a per seat cost and also a compute cost. So for every minute that you have jobs running on Circle CI, you only pay for when you're using a con container on Circle CI to run your CI CD jobs. And also, great. One other question we have here is, how is the process of validating an orb on Circle CI? And is there a way to test the orb without publishing it? So with validating the orb itself, Circle CI publishes a CLI tool that allows you to validate your files locally without pushing them to the cloud. However, if you're gonna be test, so yeah, you can do that locally. If you're gonna be testing an orb, however, it's usually just best to write the orb you can, so with the OBS, they allow you to use semantic versioning. So you can always just version it and add a version in there that allows users to use a previously tested and like a stable version. And so you can add minor versions or like other like later versions that allow you to push up, test, and then validate that. And only when you're comfortable with that, then you can have your, let's call them customers in this case, then use the, the tested and stable OBS. All right. So now looking through customer, we have about eight minutes left and I don't see any other questions. So I'm just gonna put up our contact information here so that everyone, if we didn't reach, get to your question, well, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question today or if something like, pops up in your mind later, you can just shoot us emails at this address. For me, I'm sam.olukotun at circleci.com and Brian is bread at nowsecure.com. If you have any questions, concerns, compliments, send them our way and we can respond to those later. And I just realized I wasn't even sharing the screen again. <laughs> you know, right, it it's my first time, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It, it happens. Let's try that again. So here okay. is our contact information and I'll be sending out the slides again after the webinar. So feel free to reach out to us with questions or concerns. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, Brian, for joining. This was very informational for me. And I'd like to say thank you all to our attendees. I hope you all learned something useful today. <laughs> thank you very much. We had a great session. Awesome. And with that, thank you all and have a good day. <laughs>